Welcome to another edition of Photo Talk Podcast. Today's guest is John Wormsley, an editorial photographer for over 50 years. I'm really excited to have you here, John. Welcome. Hi. Oh, I'm very glad to be here, Zach. Thank you for asking me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've wanted to get into your photographic brain for quite a while. With me classing you as an editorial photographer, would that be the right terminology? Oh, I think so, yeah. And lecturer as well? I do various things. I, years ago, I used to, at the end of a summer term in schools, they used to give me a, a group of school kids that sort of 15, 16 years old, kind of the school had finished with them. Uh, and so I had them for a week and we would do a photography project, you know, something that they wanted to do. One of them was, it was a school up in um, near Cambridgeshire somewhere, but it was horse racing territory. And they said they wanted to photograph the stables and the horses and, you know, what happened. So uh, in those days, I could say, well, come on, and they jump in my car and off we'd go to the stable and sort of um, talk to the people there. They were quite happy. Um, but I remember one of the things that they wanted to photograph was the morning gallop. And, of course, morning gallops happen rather early in the morning. Like, if you're not there at six, you miss it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I have to say, all these school kids, these teenagers, they were all there. They were up and ready, um, which I was really impressed with. Um, so I used to do that kind of thing. When I, I went to art school in Guildford, during the last year, which was 1968, um, there were demonstrations all over the place. But we as a student body felt that our courses really should be a lot better than they were. So we asked to talk to the governors about how our ideas for improving it. Um, and uh, they refused. The kind of message we got was along the lines of, no, we're in charge and you do what we tell you. And we didn't think this was right, uh, and we ended up having a sit-in. And it turned out to be the longest ever sit-in at uh, an educational institution in this country. At the end, um, Surrey County Council took us to the High Court in London to get the building back. Uh, And in the end, we had to give it back. The governors never did talk to us about how to improve things. That was Guildford Art School, wasn't it? It was, yeah, Guildford School of Art. But immediately after we'd left the building, the Minister for Education um, sent a message out to everyone insisting that all schools, colleges and universities from then on must invite students and staff onto their advisory boards. So although we didn't win our particular fight, the fact that now all colleges, schools and unis do have that is down to what we did uh, at Guildford Art School as some rebellious students way back in 1968. Uh, and we're, we're very proud of that. And it taught me also that if something's wrong, say so. You know, yeah. there's everything to gain from saying so. Uh, and especially if you can say to your, in inverted commas, opponent, how they would benefit if it's improved as well. Uh, and most times it's that people seem to have accepted that the way we do it is the best way. They don't actually look at, well, it could be better. And and so every now and then I find something which is worth complaining about and, and I stick my head above the parapet and complain. Also, in, in, in any kind of learning situation, I'm always the one who's been quite happy to ask the idiot question um, because I've not, I never was good at exams. And I recently found out I have a sort of dyslexia, which means my brain, and I'm slow at processing things. So quite often, I would not understand something at the same speed everybody else does. So I need to ask. And and what I learned from that was at the end of those sessions, other people would come up to me and say, we're so glad that I asked that question because they didn't know either, but they didn't, they would be embarrassed to ask. Yeah. And I've found that always ask. People can only say no. So one of the other things that happened at, uh, when I was at art school was I heard about this school called Summerhill, where you don't have to go to lessons if you don't want to. Um, and I'm quite an avant-garde kind of person. I, you know, I look at rules and I'll obey them if I think they're a good idea and I won't if I don't. Um, and I got in touch with A.S. Neal, who was the founder and head, and said I'd like to come and do photos. Uh, And he said, fine. So I had several trips to the school and I stayed just down the road. And so I took lots of pictures of what it was like to be uh, a student there. Yeah. Um, And these are young people that were perfectly intelligent, but they they somehow didn't fit into normal school. Then we had to sit in and I left art school. The art school 
refused to give me any qualifications. So I'm a completely unqualified photographer. Well, let me pick up on that. This was 65, 68, and Summerhill was midway through that, wasn't it? Let's look into that a little bit, because you would obviously find your calling as a photographer then decided a career was happening, was going to happen for you as a photographer. It was something you wanted to pursue, because there's something else you're not telling us about the Guildford Art School, is that you documented the city and you submitted it as a, a counter-protest, maybe? Yes. You're, you submitted the old documentary work of the city as your final presentation which probably wasn't to the satisfaction and amusement of your tutors. I don't think it went down well. Their pictures are really interesting. I look at some of them and I move through a few little time zones with these pictures. I look at some of the fashion and you would think it was now. There's a weird resonance with these pictures when you've got the cars, you've got the ashtrays on the desks. Yeah, you know it's the 70s and 60s. But then you look at some of the students and they could just be like last week. Yeah. It's really interesting. So had you had your calling then as a photographer? Had you realised that's what you wanted to do? Um, yeah, I mean, let me take a step back to when I was uh, 17 at school. Um, I went to a grammar school, but everyone acknowledged that I just scraped in. The grammar school I went to was not a high achieving school at all, but I fitted in. It suited me. No one was, I mean, a few of them were academically brilliant. Most of us weren't, but we were we were good people. We, we fitted in. Um, we enjoyed what we were doing. But when it came to careers guidance, uh, what we got in those days was we were presented with a book about five, seven centimetres thick. Each page described the job. And, and, and by that time, a pal of mine and I, we'd started the school camera club. Uh, and, and so we knew we enjoyed this sort of thing. And, and the way it described working as a photographer, um, part of it was this journalistic approach. And I thought, yeah, that is because you could go anywhere, photograph anyone, photograph anything. And that appealed. But what I found was that the best course for me was at an art school, not at a technical college. There I was doing pure mass applied mass and physics A levels and now needing to go to art school. Uh, I talked to the school and, and we agreed I would drop the physics and that time I would spend in the art department, who were brilliant because they helped give me uh, individual design um, work to do. And so I learned a lot more about design, which was particularly useful for a photographer. And then when I applied to Guildford School of Art, they, they offered me a place irrespective of, of whatever exam results I might get. Uh, so that's how I got there in the first place. So when I left, uh, I suddenly found I'm now out in the real world. Um, by that time, I had already started supplying pictures to book publishers. Yeah, I'd also photographed the anti-Vietnam War demonstration to Grosvenor Square um, with um, Vanessa Redgrave and Tari Kali. That's a Cafe Royal book, isn't it? Uh, yes, they did one of that. They yeah. also did one of Summerhill. Going back to that period of the art school in Summerhill. What were you shooting on? Um, it was with cameras borrowed from the school, from the art school. Um, and the film was mostly Tri-X, which I bought in bulk and then loaded into individual cassettes because that way it was half price. That um, and, and the kind of things that I was shooting, and, and it still applies today, is if I thought it was interesting, I'd go and do it. No forward planning about, you know, I could sell it to the Sunday Times or, you know, do a book with so-and-so. You just got on with it and did it and see where it took you. Yeah. Uh, and that, I've always felt, was, was the best way for me to do it. Take me back before Guildford. Where did it start? Where did you get that moment where the sun came through the clouds and you went, that's what I want to do? Okay. Um, council estate in Harrow, youngest of five kids. We all had hand-me-down clothes and so on. Um, this was just standard, you know, in those days. It didn't feel like you were missing out on anything. It was just how it was. Um, and again, you know, the neighbourhood was very supportive. And uh, so, you know, you got on with it. Um, going away to art school was the big leap, you know, because my father was from Yorkshire. He'd started in the mines and he'd come down south to work as a plasterer. The whole idea of, of anyone saying no to authority or questioning it was anathema to him. And so particularly when I want, I said, no, I don't want to do an apprenticeship. I want to go to art school. That was really difficult for him. 
And at the end of the art school, when I was uh, in the sitting and we were taken to the high court, he was all for coming up to the high court and apologising to the judge. And it was only my eldest sister who persuaded him not to that stopped him. But then the year after I left art school, my own Summerhill book was published by Penguins. That was the first photo book I ever did. And I could give him a copy and he could take it over to the pub and show his mates. And he could see the sense of it, you know, that there are times when you have to tell authority they're wrong. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we, we were OK in the end on that. What else happened? Oh, yeah, th things happened sort of out of the blue. Like I'd done all the Summerhill pictures. I happened to look at The Guardian one day and there was a large article about Neil, the founder of Summerhill, written by someone called Lila Berg, who I'd never heard of. But it turned out she was an author um, and did a lot of work in education. So I got in touch and I went to see her and she said, this should be a book. And because she already knew people in publishing, she could ask around. Penguin's education branch um, said, yes, we can do this. And so they sent her off to go and talk to people and she provided the pieces of text and the quotes. Um, so the book was published. It was a pretty major thing to get a Penguin publishing deal as a photographer yeah. in 1967. Yeah. 69. 69, yeah. I've got that book somewhere. Oh, good. Hang on to it. You have to sign it at some point. <laughs> when did you first pick up a camera? How old were you? Oh, goodness. Who was your influence as well around then? Nobody, really. I mean, my elder brother... He was into photography, so I, I, it really probably was him. But he was more technical. He was interested in f-stops and lenses and depths of fields and things, and, and I wasn't. And in fact, when, just jumping ahead, at art school, most of our full-time tutors were technicians. You know, the lectures were about f-stops and film speed and, and, and all this stuff. And they would review your pictures on that basis. Somewhere towards the end of the second year, someone from the fine art department came down and reviewed our photos. And that was a seminal moment for me. I've always thought it was, and I still think it was, because he didn't know anything about f-stops and film speed. He looked at an image for what it was. And I thought, this is brilliant. You know, why can't the other people, you know, why isn't he on in our departmental staff? And so I would, after that, I would spend some time talking to the fine art students and tutors just to get a different take on it. And then when I looked at what Penguin's education department was brilliant and it really was forward-looking, it was producing books which would combine and complement images, photos and whatever else, with pieces of text and with poems. And so for the first time, English departments in schools would have a book where the students could take what they wanted from it. They weren't being told, read this, and what it means is that. You know, they could just look at the pictures and the bits of text, make what they could of it, and discuss it in the class, you know. Um, and so you would get the different views, say, from two or three of the students who were coming from very different backgrounds. I know when I was, was doing that, I was from the council estate. None of my family ever went to university. Um, and yet we're in a classroom with people who are from middle class families, who own their own home, who go on foreign, foreign holidays, who read. And so you then get this mixture in the classroom that you weren't getting before, because before you were just being told what to think, you know, and that this is a good piece of text because, you know, whereas I would read it and think, well, I don't see that, you know. Yeah. Um, and with the books that Penguin Ed were bringing, it gave you license to say that you didn't see them. You know, um, so so Penguin Ed was a tremendous small company that got closed down too early because it didn't make enough money. I'll put a link to the Summerhill pictures on the information list, but the images themselves just remind me of youth. They remind me of my childhood, bonfires, dirty yeah. clothes, woodland. They just evoke memories of my childhood. If you look at it in the education context, even even now, they, they look looks totally out of context for education, doesn't it? It's they're really interesting. How was that book received by, by the academics? Um, 
I've always had a problem with academics um, because I, I never was academic and I'm still not academic. Uh, and when I hear academics talking about photography, I really don't understand much of what they're saying. And I've had this discussion with some of them um, and I don't know how to resolve it. Um, uh, so, so your question was about the book. The book, it got reprinted within six weeks and came out as an American edition as well. But it never made any money. And in those days, authors, whether you're the illustrator or the text person, you would get typically 7% of all the monies you know, from sales of the books. Now, the 7% split between two of you is like 3.5%, so it's not much. It's, it's not going to replace your equipment or anything like that. Did they not give you a small advance? There was a small advance, but then the sales had to pay for it. And, and so I kept that in the back of my mind. One of my driving things is I've never understood why artists can't be paid properly. You have things like, um, you know, if, you, if you've got a leaky pipe, you expect to pay the plumber. If you want to have a print of an image of some kind on your wall, um, you don't expect to pay as much as you would pay the plumber, you know. And so if someone sees a nice photo and they say how much and you say £75 for an A4 print, they will go, no, you know. But the plumber has a call-out charge of 80 quid, you know, before he does anything. Mm. Um, and so, and I always look back and think, well, now where has this come from? And I think it comes from schools, yeah. you know, especially in the digital age. I've, I've been in so many schools where I've seen um, if, if, if anyone in the classroom wants to do some research and find images, they go on Google, up pop all the images, they copy them, they use them. Um, and they're allowed to, but only within strict guides. And I'm looking at these teachers and that. They're way outside the guides. You know, they should be paying for this the same way that a school would pay for the books, but they're not. And, and so I think, well, this, there's something fundamentally wrong. Um, and so I, I have this, this phrase that artists should be paid too. And I think they really should. Uh, and yet with photographers bringing it up to date, so many of us have our work copied so many times. And we're, we're not asked and we're not paid. And we should be. So, you know, a group of us fight back against this and, and, and say, well, no, we find someone who's used our work. We have a go at them and say, well, no, you know, th this is my livelihood. I can't go to the checkout in Tesco and say, well, I can go on, I can do a podcast and say how lovely your food is. They don't want that. They want money, you know, strangely enough. I see that quite often with students. They can't get their head around that. The photography is a commodity. Yeah. They almost feel obliged to do things very cheaply or to give images to, to say, a band they've taken pictures of. They almost give the band the copyright and give them permission to do what they want. They feel humble. And I think it's that mindset. And I don't know where that comes from. It, it's, it's interesting. I learned very early on how to make money out of it. I kept that yeah. format and principle from day one. And it's just evolved as I've got older. I understood photography as a commodity straight away, as well as a love and a passion, of course, but you have to pay the rent. So, so what do you say to your students when they say, no, I let them use it for nothing? I say to them, when somebody asks you to do some work or want you to create some images around them, the first thing you ask is, what's your budget? And I get that into their heads that you must discuss your time and the licensing of your images in some context before you finish that conversation. Because if you walk away and you haven't discussed that, they're going to think it's for free and they're going to feel they've got full control. Yeah. Whereas you need to be educated to say, well, I'm actually in control and this is my time. This is my creativity. I'm going to license you the images. And they get it eventually. But they're still, they're still become, it's just like this humble thing they've got where they, this sort of passiveness, I mean, it's, it's interesting. You say you love academics, but you were... Now, uh, tell me about this, because how do you come from being a working photographer? Now, in the 70s, you were quite... You were working a lot, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. But how in 74 did you become a lecturer at the Architectural Association? How did that happen? Oh, that... Um, I just heard about... Oh, I know. There was a... At the... Where was it? 
Yeah, at the art school, um, there was a. He only came very occasionally, but basically he was a designer architect, and he came to the art school, and I kept in touch with him. And suddenly there was a job going at the architectural association, um, in, in in the photography area, and and so I went for an interview, and it turned out there were two jobs, and one of them was actually teaching photography to the students. And the other was running the darkroom. And so I got a friend of mine from the art school. Um, she was a fine artist, but she was a good photographer to come and run the darkroom. And then I worked two days a week uh, working with the students and teaching them communication skills. And so that's how I came to the AA, as we call it. Um, and rather like Summerhill, the AA suited me because it was, again, an avant-garde sort of place. If you're giving a lecture and anyone in, in, in the group feels it's not for them, they could just get up and leave. You know, there was nothing wrong with that. Um, we expected it. You know, why should they sit there if it's a waste of their time? So that's how I came to be there. One of the things I noticed and with, and, and, and also I was happy to be there because I like buildings. I like architecture. And at one point, when I was 17, I thought, you know, what sort of job do I want to do? And I looked into how you became an architect. Um, and and I, I spent a day at Regent Street Poly in the architecture department looking at how they, how they did it. And I came out from that thinking it was amazing what architects do, but that I couldn't do it. I didn't have that range of skills at the level that was needed. Um, to be a functioning, successful architect. But working with architects was great. Uh, so I, I had seven years doing that. I loved every minute of it. Because I was interested in photography and architecture, when there was the Armenian earthquake, um, the British government provided the cash to rebuild one of the schools in Armenia and British companies went and built it and British companies kitted it out. Uh, and because I was interested in both education and architecture, the British government, the Department for Education's architecture department, they sent me to go and photograph this school, um, which I really enjoyed, you know, because you could see how another um, culture dealt with education. Um, so I did that. That was much later, though, wasn't it? That was the 90s, wasn't it? That was colour. Was that colour? Um, that was all in colour. No, it was... Um, when was that? The The earthquake was in 1988, so it was two years after that. Yeah, 1990. Yeah. The aftermath, yeah. 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 And it meant going with two suitcases of Boeing's lights. I had to Polaroid back for my Nikon because... In those days, you had no idea whether the exposure was correct or not, unless you could do a Polaroid, and it had to be done on the same body that was going to have the, you know, the film really. Um, so I went off with all this gear, um, and, and I travelled with um, guys from the construction company. Um, so you know, we got there and they set about what they had to do, and then I was wondering about taking pictures. Yeah, so that, that's how that happened. I still love photographing buildings, but not not as a, any kind of commission thing. I just see a building and I like it, you know. Yeah. The Scottish Parliament building in Edinburgh is brilliant. Uh, I love that. The 70s was a very prolific period for you. You were working with the Architectural Association. You were working as a theatre company photographer. You were getting residencies. You were exhibiting. What about the theatre photography work? Right, that's interesting, and that actually brings us up to date. In, in the early 70s, I had a bedsit in a house in Tooting Beck, and upstairs was an actress, and she went off to do a season at Salisbury Playhouse. And this is repertory, where you have a company of people, it's the same company of people, and during the day they would rehearse one play, They'd go home and have tea. In the evening, they'd perform another play. And it, then it was a three-week rep, so it was all changed every three weeks. And, and again, like Summerhill School, I thought this was fascinating, how this was done. Um, what sort of people do it? You know, and How do they live? And so they let me come down, and I lived and worked with the company for about six weeks. Photographed one play. It was um, Mother Courage, Bertolt Brecht. 
how it was done from the very first read through to the first night, including finding all the props and bringing them all the read throughs, all the practicing the music, the singing and so on um, and, and, and so on. So it was everything and including the days off and, and going to the laundrette and so on. And, and so we recorded all of this and, and my friend, the actress from upstairs, she played the main part and we thought we could do a book of this because this is interesting. So we took the idea to three or four publishers and they all said, yes, we do it, but only if there is a well-known person in the company. And we said, well, that's the whole point. You know, this is training. You know, you will become well-known later because of your training. And they, none of them would take it on. We even got um, Maggie Smith gave us an introduction for it. Um, but even that didn't help. And in the end, it was put away for 40 odd years. But um, my next big project is to do a self-published book of it. Um, and what we've learned is that no one else has this material. In the 70s, every town and city had its own repertory company. It was a main focus for a huge number of, of the locals because they knew they could go every three weeks, they'd go and see a new play. Um, they got to know the actors because you all ended up in the same pub. Uh, and so there was this social interaction. Then television came along, um, and so repertory became less um, possible. Yeah. Um, and, and they all closed down, really. Um, about five years ago, a company came back in Windsor, and we, we spent five, six weeks with them repeating the process. Um, and we could see the huge change between the 70s and, and now. Um, there's modern technology and so on. But they had to do it with much smaller budgets. And so it wasn't a three-week rep. It was a one-week rep. And that really, it showed. E everyone worked their socks off. I mean, they were brilliant, all of them. But they did their best. But with this book, you know, I started thinking, well, who would, who could we get to, you know, say, you know, you know when you have on the back of a book, well-known person says, buy this book, it's brilliant. Well, who could we get to, you know? And, and we'd seen that several of our really big top actors very willing to, to say that they wouldn't be where they are today if it hadn't been for their training in rep. Uh, and so I wrote to some of them. All of them came up trumps, you know, and, and sent me little pieces about, um, I mean, Timothy West, it turned out, he'd done rep in Salisbury. I didn't know. Um, and, and, you know, so he gave us a lovely... Um, in the Salisbury archive, I found there were some photos of him as a young man, which he hadn't seen before. So managed to get some copies and, and give to him. There was one lovely day when I got an email from Sir Ian McKellen in the morning and one from Dame Judy Dench in the afternoon. And I thought, this, this, you know, how could a lad from the council house, you know, start getting emails from these people? And it's because of the work. You know, it's because they were so grateful to their time in rep. And they wanted Rep to come back, you know, because, you know, I meet young actors and you go through three, four years of, of, of drama school and then what? You know, you can do a one-man thing, but who does the staging? Who does the writing? Who sells the tickets? It's not like one-man band photographers, you know, once you've arranged to go and do something, you get on with it. But for actors, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Um, and, and the best thing they can do is get together as a group of three or four, you know, the writer, the director, they all perform, they all sell tickets, they rent a room in a pub and they cross their fingers. But at least they're working, they're still practising, you know, their art. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very keen that all creatives should be encouraged and helped to pay the bills, basically. What was it like working as a photographer in the 70s? How did you negotiate your clients how did it work most of my clients were either textbook publishers or government departments um they were it, it was never commercial work you know that was much better paid it was always something that um, was about ordinary people or something that needed explaining and you needed to come to it with your own ideas um so let's say with penguin with those books uh, for the english department um I would quite often, and they encouraged this, you would show them lots of prints of what you've been doing. And they might then find a bit of text to go with it. So you might be the instigator of a good spread with government departments. Um, normally, once you've, once you've worked with them once or twice and it worked well, they would just keep coming back. 
the, the equipment, well, it was all film, did help if you had a Polaroid back. Once you'd shot the film, you then had to go to the lab, you know, at like six, seven in the morning. They would process the clips. You'd go back two hours later and judge the clips and give instructions for how to process the rest of those films. You'd go and do something else for two hours, then you drive home. So that's like four or five hours of just getting the images so that you can use them. Um, and then you had to mount them and then you had to take them or send them to the publisher and leave them with them. With the what the arrangements were, I always wrote into my deals with them that I kept the copyright. Um, and when I sent an invoice for the job, it would I would write on the invoice what they could do with them and that I kept the copyright. It would be things like, you can use it in that book for one edition for one use only and or for a print run of X thousand copies. Uh, and I remember every time I typed this in, thinking, do I really need to spend time typing this in? But 20 years later, doing that was worth tens of thousands of pounds to me because later on when I found that all my main book publishing clients had exceeded so many of the agreements, I could actually show that they, they you know, because their lawyers were saying, well, prove it. And I, I'd kept all the documents, you know, up in the loft, and I could photocopy them and say, well, you know, for that book, here's what was agreed, and you've exceeded it, therefore you need to pay me. And it was on such a scale that for one publisher, you know, a big name international publisher, we finally settled on their misuse of 600 pictures in 200 titles. So it was on a huge scale. Um, and without the internet, and particularly Google Image Search, I'd never have known. And who do I blame for this? Well, certainly not the editors and the picture researchers, because they are detailed people. And I think picture researchers and editors, when they're said, look, can we use this picture in that book again? The first thing they'd ask is, do we have the right? And they'd say, well, no, we don't. So I blame the directors of all these companies who just went ahead. I mean, I can't prove this, but I think, I, you know, if it looks like a duck and cracks like a duck, it's that sort of basis. So all of that. And so I started giving talks about this. And, and I know I gave one to the photographers group at the NUJ quite some years ago. And the first thing I noticed was the room was packed out. People were standing. And so I told them how to do it, what you need in order to probably succeed and actually get paid in the end. And some months later, out of the blue, I got a phone call from a, a music photographer who said he, he was there at the talk and he thought he'd have a go at this. And he said that morning, he just received the check for £2,000 and he can now pay the mortgage. And he thought, oh, you just ring up and say thank you. So I, I was, you know, it, it can help. And so I give talks now, I call it my getting your ducks in a row talk. And I give it to young photographers and artists and writers and so on. What to do so that you're still easy to work with, but you just have it written down what was agreed and that you keep it so that later on you stand a chance of being paid for your work that was used that you didn't know about. Uh, and I, I still do that now. Um, in fact, I've got a one thing I now do a lot of is, you know, you go to an exhibition, art galleries and, and photography galleries, and you see work and you think, I wish I'd known this exhibition was coming on because my work would have fitted this. And I thought there has to be some way of curators and artists getting together. And then out of the blue, I found there is. Uh, and it's, it's a website called Curator Space. Curators list on that what they're working on. And artists can look at it and say, well, I've got this and I've got that. And I now do quite a lot of exhibitions with other artists, not just photographers. Um, and at the moment, I've got an exhibition running in Edinburgh of the Edinburgh work. I've got work in, in an exhibition in Tbilisi in Georgia. End of the month, I've got work in an exhibition in Sao Paulo. That's the first for me. I've not done South America before. But with the Sao Paulo one, um, I've just seen the work from all the other artists who are in it. And I think their work is really high level. Um, they're proper professional artists. So I've suggested to the curator that we offer one of my talks of how you safeguard your rights so that you can pay the bills. And so that is another thing that's, you know, going to happen. Yeah. How to say, as in, get your ducks in order. How to get your ducks in a row. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's simple things like at the bottom of every email, say um, that you assert your, 
what is it? You assert your moral right. Yeah. You know, there's no obvious reason why you're putting it there, but there's a legal reason. Yeah, I, I mentioned ducks because if you look at John's website, he has a little quote at the bottom that says, he'll teach you how to get your ducks in order. <laughs> Everything we've looked at, in terms of your working life in the 70s has been covered but is sort of documented in an order with Cafe World Books, hasn't it? You've got Summerhill, you've got the School of Architecture, you've got Hales, you've got the theatre work, you've got the sit-in, and then you've got the Grosvenor Square demo. And the Anna Children's Theatre. And the North London Children, yeah. yeah. There's a couple of things which are not in there, which I actually, I actually find quite interesting that you've covered Wimbledon which was totally off track. Yeah. I found that really interesting. Yeah. In my head, when I saw your Wimbledon shots, I was like, is that really John Walsh yeah. that you're doing Wimbledon? I thought it was quite interesting. I did find your British Civil Service shots yeah. really interesting. It was like another world. Yes. And I think you can buy these all from Cafe World Books, and I always put the links to yeah. Cafe World Books when I, when I do these videos and podcasts. I can't remember the shot, but it's the Welsh Valley coal mines and there's that valley shot with all the sort of layers of the, the industry and the oh, coal yeah. and the houses and the cars. Yeah. And, and that's one of my favourite pictures of yours, in the colour pictures. And one of my favourite black and white shots, which resonates with me, is your crowd shot in the protests. Grosvenor Square demo shot, where it's the crowd shot. And it reminds me of a not a similar shot, but a shot which Andrew Wyard did. Do you, remember, you know Andrew, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, of course, with EP UK. Do you remember seeing his um, Scargill picture? Yeah. Met Andrew many years ago. We were working on some stuff online in the early 2000s, and he sent me that shot, and I just sat looking at it thinking, wow. Period of the 70s and 80s, crowd shots have always fascinated me because you can tell so much about what's going on, if it's a good shot, of course. And your Grosvenor Square one brought back memories of Andrew Wyard's um, Arthur Scargill shot and, and I just it sort of engrossed me a little bit and that's what photography should do and that's what it should be about what was that Grosvenor Square one was that the anti-Vietnam demo was it it was yeah I was in I was in my third year at art school um, and I borrowed the college camera and I hitched into London uh, and I just recorded what was in front of me um, with no no more plans than that really but it, it gave me that the best known picture is the one of Vanessa Redgrave holding the letter to the American ambassador. And that's that's the first one that the National Portrait Gallery bought. At the year 2000, the millennium, they had a big exhibition of pictures that rep represented the times. And uh, so they included that one in, in, in that exhibition. And funnily enough, I've just written to Vanessa because I've got an idea for a picture of her with someone else. And uh, I won't say who the other person is, but it's, it's two well-known people. And hoping to do a picture of the two of them at home together, because uh, I think they're buddies, but no one's done a picture of the two together. Um, and it's occurred to me that it, it would be an important picture. Can you do that before I broadcast this, just because somebody nicks it? <laughs> well, they don't know who the other person is. Good, um, good point, so, uh, good point. Um, so sometimes it's it's a matter of you suddenly have a good idea, you know, and you suddenly think, but wait a minute, that would work, you know, and then it's down to asking politely and um, seeing if you can do it. Uh, so I, I suppose over the years, I, I've managed to, I, I think I'm one of the very, very few photographers who's managed to pay all the bills for 50 years from his photos. Yeah. Apart from that period in the 70s when I was teaching and I had to teach to pay pay the bills, uh, apart from that, I've not done anything else. I I do encourage young people now to, you know, if they seriously want to make a living and carry on doing this, um, they've got to be much harder about making people pay for, you know, what is used. They have to get their ducks in order. Yeah. And also, I I would make a point that the staff who teach them have to be much harder about this um, because I'm, I've employed several students over the years where they come and help me, you know, and I, I pay them. And, and I learn a lot from them and they learn a lot about business from me. And it, it was very clear to me that the staff in, in the art schools and universities where these students were, they would do a sort of two or three hours on copyright and, you know, the business side of things. It's nowhere near enough. 
Yeah. Um, and they really need to take this more seriously. Uh, I did a book signing at the Photographer's Gallery with um, some of the Cafe Royal books. And two students came up and we had a chat. They had just finished four years at a London art school. And they actually asked me, what is copyright? Wow. And, and that, that may be an extreme, but the, the colleges are really letting down their students because they will not admit that doing a two or three hour session, even a day session, so that you understand what copyright is and you understand its place, you really have to treat it from the real world perspective. What do you do when your artwork is being sold on eBay on t shirt mm. It's not good enough just to write and say, you can't do this. You've got to have a plan in place because otherwise it'll carry on and it does carry on. I've been doing this nearly 10 years now. I've settled 160 or more cases myself. Um, this week I had to write to an architectural firm in New York, um, to a private school in Sussex and to someone else I can't remember. But that's just one week, you know, and it's just me as a one-man band. The scale of it is absolutely horrendous. One of my biggest infringers is HM Government. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, they they drew up and passed the um, copyright law, um, but they don't seem to understand it applies to them. It's incredible. What's interesting about what you said, though, is I used to shoot for COI. Oh, yeah, me too. Yes. I never signed anything. They were very good payers, weren't they? But they, I never signed a thing. And I got away with not signing anything. So I do what I want with the pictures. I got paid. They did what they want. But I never put anything in writing or signed anything to give them full copyright over. I refused. What year was that? That was just before Cameron turned in because it was, it was, they scrapped it, didn't they? They put a new quango in when, to, when, when Cameron moved into the government. Oh, yeah. Labour lost because it was a Labour thing, wasn't it? When Labour lost the election yeah. and Cameron came in, they scrapped all of that sort of see why then they yeah. restructured it and it became ridiculous to try and associate yeah. your business in their system and I give up the COI were great though yeah I like working with them because they would send you off to do anything it was fascinating um but one of the things that and this has come up I know of at least two or three times with people asking what do I do now is you go through college you come out and you start working you have a very good relationship with a magazine or a company or whatever, and they get you to go off and photograph things and they then publish them. And that goes on very well for sort of 10 years or so. And then the company is sold. You get new management, you get a new picture person, and you find that they stopped calling you, but they're still using all the pictures that you took. And people have come to me and said, you know, can they do this? You know, um, and, and so, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but I've learned enough that I can point them in the right direction. Yeah. And, you know, when when they start getting letters from that company's lawyer saying, yes, we can do this because, you know, we commissioned you and we paid for it. And, and you have to look at it and think, well, not necessarily. And so then, you know, you point them to a proper lawyer, you know, and, and um, it can help enormously because, you know, in, in circumstances like that, probably the photographer owns the copyright, not the commissioner. Um, but you need to look at every case carefully and, you know, what was written in the agreement or what was what was not written. You know, if it's not written, then the photographer still owns the copyright. You've associated yourself for a long time with EP UK, which is Editorial Photographers United Kingdom, which was set up, I think, was it David Hoffman who set that up? I, I, I wasn't there when they set it up, but I think there were four or five people who got together and started it. David was one, yeah. David's an amazing individual photographer and a real advocate yes. for copyright and law and justice and, and he's one of the most experienced photographers I've ever come across who's been at the thick of legal wranglings and, and stuff and he's, ama he's amazing. It was interesting in the 90s we had an office in London and David was sort of, how can I put it, godlike figure in the in our in our world of you wouldn't mess with David Hoffman he was a lovely guy but in terms of any legalities anybody who crossed a photographer so we had this little thing in the office he knows because I told him working alongside Jazz Coulson in, in an office there and Mark Jackson and anytime we had any problems with a client or anything we were just running a you know an editorial office photography office and anytime we had any problems with clients we just used to look and say should we Hoffman <laughs> yes and that's the word the terminology we always used when we yeah. were going to go 
and get a clag and, and we just we would huff him and uh, because we held him in such high yeah. regard as like somebody who just you didn't mess with as a photographer and we learned so much yeah. from him but he's I'm going to do him a podcast soon he's just a nice guy. He's such a nice guy yeah he, he and I often if one of us has a problem to do with copyright or dealing with them we often talk it over together I mean one when I started looking at my book publishers who next needed all the rights one of them their lawyers wrote to me and said, look, this is the final offer. Uh, it was X thousand and it's to cover everything, you know, whether we know about it or not. Uh, and, you know, I needed to pay bills and I was inclined to accept it because it was a reasonable amount. Um, but I had a long talk with David um, and he outlined the different options, short term and long term. And in the end, I went back to them the next week and said no. And so that case carried on. In the end, they paid me. I think it was nine times that final offer that they'd made with no non-disclosure agreement or anything. And uh, again, I learned from that that you can say no and you can keep, if you're sure that you're on safe ground, just carry on saying no because they don't have a leg to stand on. Yeah. Take me to Wetzler Hills and your book. You've got a new book out. Take me to how that came about. Right. Talk about the book and the project. And the, that was 79? It was 79. By then, I was still teaching at the Architectural Association. But I was actually living in an art centre, which, uh, imagine a big country house with no heating. It was that sort of thing. Uh, but the people running it uh, provided somewhere to live and somewhere to work for a wide range of artists. There were filmmakers, dancers, a guitar maker, potters, uh, a well-known ceramicist called Elizabeth Fritch and lots of others um, and one was a weaver she was Scottish and, and we both heard about this opportunity in Wester Hales to you know just on the edge of Edinburgh they had built a new housing scheme and in the middle they had a brand new education centre and it was the first one of its type in Edinburgh and it allowed not only the kids to come to school but also parents could sit in on lessons as well and the art department wanted to get an artist of some kind in who would um, be there for three weeks and would interact with the, the kids in the school and the wider community. Um, and in the end, uh, I got it. And they said they gave it to a photographer because photographers tend to go out and talk to people. All the other kind of artists, most of them, sit in the corner of a room and you know they don't really interact with the neighbourhood. Um, so And they gave me a house to live in for three weeks. And so I would spend my time working with the, the students in the school and with wandering about the neighbourhood, talking to people. And that's how it began. And, and so last year I thought, we've got this material. It really should be done as a book, you know, because now you can sell published books so easily. And I, I thought, no, we should do this. And I'd done another one before where I'd worked with a student who did the design of the book because I can't afford to pay a proper designer. But uh, I, I found that if you can go to, and I did this with Edinburgh, I went to Edinburgh College of Art and said, look, I want someone to design this book of Edinburgh pictures and material. Um, and, and they gave me three or four people to you know, look at. And so as a group, they did all the retouching on the scans of the black and white pictures. And one of them designed the book. And I love working with students because Clearly, they don't know everything to do with book design, so we had to find things out, you know, together. We ended up with this nice book at a price level that anyone could afford, designed by a student. So that student now has a real book in their folio. I'm going to work with her now on another book. But the Wester Hales book um, went straight into the uh, National Art Library at the V&A. Um, so, you know, my student can now sort of say that, you know, she's got a book in the V&A. And, you know, you can do this if it's done carefully. Uh, and if you make sure the final thing looks good enough, you know, it's not a hardback 45 pound coffee table book. It's something which was edited for that locality. It, it has um, uh, contributions from people who were there at the time. And in fact, once the book came out on the cover, there's this photo of a little white dog standing on a brick pyramid. Once the book came out, I got this email out of the blue from a woman who said, that was my dog. He was called Snowy. Um, and I thought, this is brilliant because you're involving the locality. 
mostly people who would never think they'd ever be in a book. Um, but there was this woman telling me about Snowy. For the reprint, I included what she said about Snowy and her uh, in the new version of the book. Um, and when I was there, the art department picked one girl to spend a morning with me, wondering about looking at how I do it and so on. And I heard from her as well. She must be, what, 55, 60 now. And she told me that when I pinned up some contact sheets and little prints in, in the school reception, that was the first time she'd ever been to an exhibition. She'd never seen, you know, pictures on the wall together before. I thought, brilliant. You know, it's not something anyone would have expected, but that meant a big thing to her. And, and what was my other thought? So when the book came out, I sent it to each of the people who had contributed to it, including this girl that had, you know, spent the morning with her. Uh, and she said, you know, she spent the evening in tears because of the memory of the place and all the people and what had happened. The same thing applied to my Summerhill book that, you know, it was on sale in the States and here and so on. And many, many years later, I heard from a, a, a woman who, she was a child and, and the family lived in, in New York City. And they wanted to, to work out, well, where should their daughter go to school? And they'd heard of Summerhill and they got my book. And apparently every night for six weeks, they curl up together looking at my book. Wow. And they decided that, uh, all of them, the girl as well, that she would go to Summerhill. And she told me she did. She had many years very happy at Summerhill. And it was very largely because of my book. So I think that all artists... Um, Whatever they do and say has an effect on people, and you probably won't know anything about it. You're lucky if you do find out. Be careful what you say and what you do, um, and be nice to people. Yeah, you really enjoyed shooting Wesley Hills because you can tell in your pictures. It was very like where I grew up. And in fact, all the people that I heard from, without any prompting, said how supportive the neighbourhood was. I mean, this was a rough area. It had drugs problems and so on. But the neighbourhood was very supportive. And they all individually said how good the teachers had been. Um, so all of that is in, is in the book. I find the image quite humorous in parts. I think there's a bit of fun running through some of the construction of your composition and the way you yeah. used people. There's definitely a bit of humour in there. Yeah. It just comes across as a book which you can see you're happy doing it. When you start adding humour to your work, it's not easy, is it, to add humour to your work? You know, people do sometimes the strangest things and other times just think that you just look at it and you think, really? Yeah. And you smile. And things which yeah. don't, well, they change their meaning, you know, three or four decades later, you know, that image means something entirely different. Yeah. Wesley Hales saw the end of the 70s for you. What were you shooting with all the way through then after you stopped stealing the cameras from the college? <laughs> it, it was, I had a Leica of my own because um, people advised me that don't scrimp on the equipment, you know, get the best camera and the best lens because you're going to be looking at your pictures for decades and you don't want to be thinking, I wish I'd spent another 50 quid and bought the proper stuff. So I, I had... It was either one or two Leica bodies and I think three lenses and that was it. And then I found, even though people were saying Leicas were the right thing because they, they brought the right atmosphere and so on, and I'm thinking, yeah, but I'm missing pictures because of they're, they're not through the lens and there's no zoom. And so I traded it in for Nikons. Uh, and, and in order to get the, all the jobs done, that was a good move. And now when I, I like street photography and, and I, I looked at what, what camera do most people use? And there's quite a variety of it. One stood out and it was the Fuji 100F, I think it's called. And so I looked at that to think, well, I better get one of those. But again, I thought it's a fixed lens. It's just not suitable, you know, for street photography in my mind. There's something which is, I mean, I, I use Fuji X series, but those, and, and one, one of those bodies with a zoom lens, I think, is much more suitable. You can set it on silent. You know, you don't have to have a motor drive sound going. But even now I'm thinking um, camera phones are extraordinarily good. Yeah. Um, you know, they, and, and when you get them with two and three lenses and they shoot in raw, um, and I think, well, perhaps one of those. Okay, it's a thousand quid. But, you know, a Fuji body costs, you know, 
I always romanticized about it. Like I always looked at them as some sort of iconic symbol of photography, which they are. And without any doubt, they are beautiful and the quality is amazing. But I tried a Leica, couldn't use it. I bought a Konica Hector, Hexar, spent £1,500 on that. I couldn't use it. I had a Mermaid 7. I couldn't use it. Yeah. I couldn't adjust to it. And I always wanted to go back to my Nikon. The simple F100 with the 35 mil lens was just simplicity for me. Yeah. It was beautiful. It, it felt good in my hand. So did a Leica and so did a Mermaid 7, but I just could never use yeah. them. And I always admired the world, the people who, who've used yeah. them. I just you can really master them for me. It's amazing. And I think for each of us, the the balance is different. You know, I know probably like you, I know people that will use that um, Fuji 100F and be delighted with it. Um, and, and I once won a, what was it? It was a Fuji X Pro 2 body, which is kind of like a light. I couldn't use it. It just didn't work in the way that my brain worked. Um, so I got rid of that and got the XG3. That works the way that I work. Yeah. It's, it's the one. I, I put on, on mine, I put black tape over the word Fuji and put black tape over the XD3 and so on. Because I found you could, you could be doing street photography. And without fail, some middle aged bloke would come over and ask what you thought about the XD4 as opposed to the XD3 with the. Di and I'm thinking, I couldn't care less about you know, I don't know about these cameras. This one's not what I want. Um, and let's talk about the pictures. I am exactly the same. I cannot talk about equipment yeah. at all. What's next for you, Dan? You've got this big archive. You've got exhibitions coming up. You've got new books coming up. How's your archive doing? What are you doing with it? Um, well, I spent a long time scanning the net. Um, and with, with David, we worked out together a system, so we both actually have the same bit of kit for doing this. Um, it's a, oh, I'm looking at it now. What's it called? It's a Bezler dual film scanner available from the states not made anymore so you have to find a, a used one and get it shipped over but the benefit is rather than a scanner that scans the film you use a camera a digital camera and they are now so good uh, digital camera bodies that you take a photo of your neck basically um and and with my i've got a d800 i use so i get a sort of 40 megabyte image every time I take a picture and the way it's set up with the various bits of software it works well you know for me so I've got all these things I'd, I'd send them off someone else does the spotting the retouching um, and then I edit it down so I've got this archive mostly scanned now I've got more to put on my website I've got another two things I want to suggest to Craig that he does as a Cafe Royal book I want to do a big coffee table book. It's either called a monograph or a monogram. I never can remember, but the one which is somebody's work altogether of my work. I want to do that. I want to carry on giving talks to beginning photographers because I, wa I want to spread this message that you really do have to be businesslike, you know, to save yourself later on. What else? And carry on doing these exhibitions because each one I do, I can then look at work from other artists, you know, whether they're sculptors or painters or, you know, whatever. Uh, and see work I, I didn't didn't know about, you know. And people are beginning to buy prints. And I've had discussions with other photographers. You can look at, you know, serious photographers and they sell prints off their website. And when I set my website up, I thought, well, I need to be able to do this. What do you charge for a print? And I once did a weekend course with Magnum and it was about selling to the fine art market and selling print. And someone asked, what's the minimum that you would sell, you know, Magnum photographer would sell a print for? And they said, the minimum is a thousand pounds. And the whole audience went, <laughs> and, and, and the thought of, wouldn't that be nice? But anyway, I, so I got in touch with various photographers and said, look, you sell prints off your website at, at certain prices. I think it varied from 75 to 150. And I said, do you sell them? Do people buy them? And overall, the reaction was no. Might Somebody might buy one once in a blue moon. And I thought, now, why is that? And I also talked to curators at museums, people that run, you know, big collections. Um, and they said, they would never buy something off a photographer's website. They need to know the backstory. They need to know this photographer has a big following on social media. I mean, I don't even do social media. And where their work 
fits with other well-known people's work. And, and if one collection in London has a lot of work from a photographer, another collection in London then would probably not want to collect that person. And so you have all these, these things that change how saleable a print might be. My, my lady is an artist. You know, she does exhibitions with other artists and you sell the originals and or prints. And so we often look at what sells and why does it sell? And I put some work in, in there's an annual exhibition called um, Discerning Eye. It's towards the end of the year and they have a big show at the Mal Galleries in London. And so I put work forward for this and they selected four, which was more than I was expecting. So I got them framed. These are A3 prints and delivered them. And then we went along to the, um, the private view and found three had already sold. And I was gobsmacked. I mean, these are selling at 395 each and four just went and I don't really know why I asked the organizer you know can I talk to the buyers who are they and he said no <laughs> um, they don't give out that information um, so it, it, so this is ahead you know you, you can I, I really want to, to do more exhibitions and in slightly different places because I know years ago when the Charing Cross Hospital opened I thought now there's a place to do an exhibition you go in a hospital, there are people just waiting. I mean, even the people who, who are inpatients, but they're allowed to walk about, they've got nothing to do. Um, and so within two weeks, um, Kodak helped me with, I borrowed some ex exhibition screens from them. Within two weeks, the exhibition was up. And, and when I was finishing putting it up, one, one of the inpatients came and said, you're not going to leave those there, are you? And I said, well, yeah, you know, for people to look at. He said, well, don't expect them all to be there when you come back. Um, but they were. I'm very grateful to my local hospital who look after my eyes uh, and have been very good. Um, and, and so I've said to them, look, you have a corridor where you put up, you know, local artists put up work. I said, I'd love to put up some of my work as a thank you, you know, to particularly the eye department and other departments for, you know, the rest of the family. Um, and so once COVID is kind of a little less than it is now, you know, we will do that exhibition. Uh, and I, I think my work, they've never had anything like it there, because it's mostly local art groups and so on who put work up or local amateur photographers. But I want to put up, uh, and normally they fill the space with too many pictures. You know, I'm a firm believer that less is more, you know, let the pictures breathe, you know, have some space. So I'll have very many fewer pictures, but it'll be a very different experience for the people looking at them. Um, and, and I don't expect anyone to buy any, but I've got postcards, you know, of them, you know, and they can sell them, you know, they can sell postcards, you know, which are, I don't know, less than a pound each. So again, anyone can buy them. Uh, so that's, that's where, you know, that's, uh, and the book on, on repertory theatre, which is going to take an enormous amount of time. But yeah, so that's, that's what, I shall be spending time doing. What about a bigger retrospective exhibition or book? What about a sort of book, a seminal book, which is about your life? The, the monograph or monogram, whichever it is. Um, and, and yes, that would need to have an exhibition. Well, I would want it to have an exhibition. And with the repertory theatre book, um, oh, here's an interesting point of who wants things. I did talk to the v &A photography department about my work. I showed them some. They're not interested. However, the VNA has a lot of my work already, but it's the books. They've got all the books I've ever done. All the Cafe Royal books are at the VNA. And so and then their theatre and drama department is interested in, in the repertory company book uh, and material because as, as I said, no one else in the country has that material. Um, and so they, they, I think that it would fit very well there. But they're, they're basically not doing anything for three years because they're moving to brand new premises and they're all busy, you know, having that built properly and then moving in. Um, so I have to wait for that. Yeah. But yeah, so, so there's, there's still things ahead, you know, that, that I'm doing. And, and basically anyone can do, you know, and you just need to keep going. And, and find some way of funding it, you know, some crowdsourcing. So, yeah, that's, that, that's what's ahead. You know, I think what's interesting is 
John, you've got relentless energy and there's, there's obviously a strong dynamo burning in there. It's been really interesting finding out about how you have engaged with the world, engaged with photography and engaged with people, you know, your your visions for the next year and whatever it takes you. And it's, it's, it's amazing to find that out. And, and thank you. I really appreciate your time. And I hope somebody listening to this somewhere along the line will get some inspiration and just maybe... What is interesting about these things is understand a little bit more about the man behind his pictures. And that was the purpose of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. And if anyone who listens to this thinks they want to get in touch, then do. You you can contact me through my website. I'll put all the links and everything below. Thank you, John. Uh, It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Zach. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. We are floored. We are Bound down, see us, careless corpse, see us, steal the dawn, we are storm. We are storm. See us born, see us. Wind down, see us fly.